Well, hello there, Merry Christmas, and welcome to this special edition of the Creepy Fox Scary Stories podcast. If you watched the previous video, then you might have seen that I wasn't planning on uploading today, but I decided to work some Christmas magic and get you guys a brand new episode. So make sure to leave a like rating. And also, if this is the first time you're joining us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it as we upload some of the best scary stories and true crime content that you're going to hear on YouTube. Anyway, sit back and relax as we get started with these scary stories. Oh yeah, and make sure to share down below what you did for Christmas, as well as what you got. I'm not really sure if this is where this post really belongs, but I think it fits pretty well. Right now, I'm a senior in high school. When I was a freshman, I had my two closest friends. I'll call them Tara and Raya. Tara had a childhood friend that also went to school with us, and I'll call him Bob. Anyway, we were all pretty good friends. We would always hang out, as friends do. I wasn't necessarily close with Bob, but I talked to him a lot. Pretty much every day we would sit on a bench next to Tara's locker and wait for her after school. We talked a lot then. Then, on the last day of school before finals week, Raya came up to me and said that Bob had a crush on me and was going to ask me out. I did not like him like that, so I told her to tell him that I wasn't allowed to date until I was 16 years old. Yeah, I should have told him myself, but I was 14 and never had a boy ask me out before, so I thought I handled it pretty well. After that, I never really talked to Bob anymore. I kind of avoided him. Sophomore year, he tried asking me to one of the dances, but I turned him down again. I continued to avoid him. Him and Tara started getting really close as well, and I mean very close. He was like super protective of her. Junior year, there were a couple of days where he sat with me and a couple of other people at lunch, but that didn't last long. He went back to eat alone at a table. First semester this year, he still sat alone and we asked him a few times if he wanted to sit with us, but he always declined. A few nights ago, my friend Diana called me and said to stay away from Bob because he might be dangerous and he might target me because of freshman year. I asked what she was talking about, so she told me. A guy I'll call Cam started talking to Tara a lot this year. He's a nice guy too. I then come to find out that Bob wasn't too happy about Cam starting to talk to Tara more, and Bob actually threatened Cam at gunpoint. So, Cam told my now friend Ethan and Ethan told Diana who told me. Holy shit, I'm giving myself a headache. Diana and Ethan are both in a group chat on some map with Tara, Bob, and another girl, Kate. Yesterday, Bob started posting a bunch of gifts. It was of some guy shooting up a school from a TV show. And at the top, it said, One, two, three, all the kids bullied me but they are not so cool since I shot up the school. And then he posted a picture outside of the group chat, but still in the app of a smiley face, pointing at a gun at the screen with a caption that read, You know who you are. Kate asked him about it and took a screen cap before he deleted it all. She sent them to our school social worker, along with Ethan and maybe Diana. So the school does know about it and are talking to Bob about it. Bob has apparently threatened a few times that he wanted to shoot up the school and says he has a gun in his car. We have also tried to talk to Tara about this, but she doesn't seem to care or is trying to protect him. We aren't super sure as of right now. So far, this is all we've gotten to, but I'll keep you guys posted on any future events. Update. He has been kicked out of school until he gets a therapist. I'm not saying this solved the problem or that we are out of danger, but he has to get help now. So let's see if this helps. 
Update number two. He's back in school and nothing has happened. I think he's better now though. We are graduating in a little more than a month from now. And after that, he will hopefully be gone for good. So let me get a couple of things straight. Our little village was the kind of place where everyone knows everyone and I could count the amount of houses on two hands. We were a really quiet and close-knit community and nothing ever happened there. Proper out in the stick stuff. One night a few years ago, my mom and stepdad had gone out to this concert and left me in charge of my little brother and the dog. I wasn't very old, about 14 years old, and I felt really proud that my parents trusted me enough to do that. I thought I was a pretty cool big brother, and I thought we'd be doing cool babysitter stuff, like staying up late, eating pizza, etc. I'm kind of glad we did, because I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't. At about 10.30pm, the power cut out. I didn't think anything of it because the weather hadn't been great lately and I figured that had something to do with it. Anyway, I got some candles out of the cupboard and lit them and put some of our favorite songs on. As soon as I sat back down, Sonny, my little brother, turned to me and, being the weird little kid he was, told me very calmly that someone was outside. I was a little bit confused by this, but the dog hadn't done anything so I presumed it was just the neighbors out there or something. He just shrugged and then went back to his drawings. Now there is a running joke in our house that you don't need a clock with a dog around because he is such a creature of habit that he will consistently get up at exactly the same time every night to tell you that it's time to initiate his nightly go to bed protocol. It was about three quarters of an hour after the power went out when my dog decided that now was the time. I told Sonny to go get the dog his biscuit while I let him out for a piss. Now, our kitchen is an extension to the original house and as such has a flat roof that's completely low to the ground compared to the rest of the house and offers easy access to the bathroom window. As I open the door so the dog could do his thing, Sonny pushes past me in the doorway and whispers, I know you're out here and I'm calling the police. As he turned around with the biggest, proudest smile you have ever seen on his face, there was a very distinct rustling coming from just above the doorway. I don't think I'll ever forget the way Sonny's face dropped when he looked just above my head. I looked up. The man sitting on the roof above me then panicked, tried to kick me as he then ran off into the next door neighbor's garden and, presumably, into the cornfields surrounding our village. Needless to say, I was scared shitless and Sonny was bawling his eyes out too. I ushered him inside as quickly as I could and I got a knife from the kitchen. We both then went to his room and I told him to try and get some sleep while I waited for our parents to arrive back. It was an agonizing long four hours before they eventually did return. My stepdad immediately went outside to check to see if everything was alright. I heard them talking about how something had smashed the fuse box. Obviously. We called the police, but they didn't come until later that day. They did a search of the immediate premises and found a makeshift bed in a nearby disused barn, along with pictures of silhouettes of us in the shower through the frosted glass. I think it's pretty safe to say the whole experience definitely shook us up. We moved out as soon as we could, but I still shut curtains whenever I can and I see shadows underneath every door I see. As for Sonny, he keeps quiet about it, but I'm not sure if that's just because his brain has cut it out or what. So, yeah, weird kitchen roof stalker. Let's not meet.
This happened in 2011. I just gotten out of a rough relationship a few months prior to this happening. My friends encouraged me to try dating again, so I caved and made a profile on the website, Plenty of Fish. I was surprised with how many messages I'd received within the first few hours. Most were just people saying hi or asking to hook up. I wasn't looking for a hookup, so I ignored those messages. After about a week, a guy roughly an hour away from me messaged me. He was cute, so I messaged him back. The conversation was pretty casual at first. He asked if I'd like to go for a coffee sometime, and not thinking anything of it, I said, sure. This is where it started to get weird. He started to get pushy and asked when we could grab a coffee. I told him I didn't have my own car, so I'd have to borrow my mom's car to meet up with him. He offered to come pick me up, but I wasn't comfortable with the idea. The next message made my blood run cold. It read, I'm sure your hometown isn't that big. If I knocked on a few doors, someone would be able to tell me where you lived. Are you crazy? I replied. I'm sorry, but that's kind of creepy. This just pissed him off. He messaged me multiple times after this. They said, You know, I have a gun. I could shoot you and make you disappear. And nobody would look for you. You're nothing but a dirty slut. I could kill you. I'll throw you down a well. And no one will ever find you. I was really scared at this point. So I asked him to please leave me alone. He replied with the following. I know where your hometown is. It's not a big town. And I can find you. At this point, I'd had enough. And I blocked him. I reported his account to Plenty of Fish, and then I deleted my account. I was really on the edge for the next few weeks after the fact. I was afraid he was actually going to come and look for me. So, to the creepy guy who threatened to kill me on Plenty of Fish, let's not meet ever. This happened well over 10 years ago, so I'll try my best to describe the events accurately. One of my childhood homes had a balcony that was attached to both my mother's bedroom and mine via big double glass doors in each of our rooms. Next to the balcony are two trees, one I often use to climb up and down from the balcony. This balcony faced out to the street. One night, when I was about 13, 13 year old girl by the way, and my brother and mother weren't home. I was reading in bed with a very dim reading light. I heard what sounded like something or someone moving in one of the trees outside, but this didn't worry me as possums and bats are common in our area. Now, I had this thin curtain on the glass doors that separated my room and the balcony. As mentioned previously, the doors faced out towards the street, where street lamp light was always visible through my curtains. Shortly after hearing the tree rustling noises, I see a shadow slowly move past the doors, at which point I immediately turn off my reading light and freeze like a deer in headlights. The shadow is tall, so it wasn't one of the neighbor kids that I'm friends with, and it wasn't my all five foot mother. The person moved slowly, creeping as though they were trying to not be noticed. They wouldn't likely be able to see into my room, but I could see them thanks to the street lights behind them creating a dark silhouette. They moved past my doors out of sight. I sat there unable to move or even think about what to do other than be absolutely still. That is, until I heard another sound, the sound of someone trying to open a glass door. My mom's doors to the balcony. I didn't know if she had locked them or not, but I wasn't taking any chances. So I moved as quickly and as silently as possible so I could go to my bedroom door and locked it. I listened for what the person was doing now. They were still jiggling the glass door handle, but it sounded like the doors weren't opening. I felt relief. This person couldn't get in. All I had to do was wait for them to realize that 
and then they would leave, right? Well, I heard light footsteps move back along the balcony to my set of glass doors until I saw his shadow stop directly in front of them. Again, I froze. He couldn't see me. He couldn't know I can see him. I saw a shadow of a hand reach up to my door handle, and my heart stopped. Had I actually locked those doors myself today? I was out there earlier. What if I forgot? The seconds leading up to him and grabbing the handle felt like an eternity. But thankfully, when this person tried to open the door, it did not open. It was locked. I sighed such a sigh of relief. I was worried he had heard it. After this, he began pacing the length of the balcony. I didn't have a mobile phone. My mom thought I was too young to have one yet, and the landline was at the other end of the house, but I was too scared to take my eyes off of this person, even to call for help. I was silently crying, tears falling down my cheeks as I internally prayed they were just going to leave. Then I heard him stop moving. He then said, I could just break the glass, you know. Before I could even process this, I saw car headlights turn around the corner of my street and then stop at our property gate. My mom was home. The person on the balcony moved out of sight, and I heard a loud thump as they jumped off of it. But when my mom came inside, I was hysterical and was barely coherent in telling her what happened. Eventually, I got the message across and she called the police. They never found or caught anyone, but a neighbor reported a truck in the street that matched the description of a truck that had been reported recently for attempted child abductions near my school a block away. Since I walked that short distance daily, the police suspected that he had followed me or seen that I lived there and waited for me to be alone. So, creepy dude who scared the hell out of a 13 year old girl, let's never meet. We all have that one ex that just grinds our gears. But mine is fairly more creepy than the average drunk texting arsehole. About three years ago, I was in a long distance relationship with a younger man, meaning he was only 17 at the time, while I turned 19 in the relationship. His name is Peter. Peter was not a nice person to say the least. He thought that the first impressions he made on people were the only one he needed and as such, he stopped being nice, polite, or reasonable to people after the first meeting. I was young and saw past this, thinking I could somehow change him. However, this abuse towards people around me and myself eventually became too much and I broke off the relationship with him. The breakup went smoothly all things considered, except he wanted me to say the words so he could play the victim. This had been a core element of our fighting because he hinted that he wanted the breakup, but instead of just saying it, he kept me on the hook and became even more abusive. I'm getting sidetracked here, but the point was that I thought of the matter as resolved and entered a loving relationship with my current boyfriend shortly after this. Then came the day where Peter wanted to get his belongings back I texted him a list of everything he had left in my apartment, and he okayed that it was everything. We also made an appointment for him to stop by my apartment around 3pm the following Thursday. I have no intentions of letting him back into my home, nor being alone with him, since he suddenly seems to have many mood swings after seeing me in another relationship. He has been blocked from my Facebook account but somehow knew I was in a new relationship, which was a major red flag to me and my boyfriend. Thursday came, and I felt eager just to be done with it. My boyfriend and I are walking home from high school when my phone rings. It's Peter. He yells at me that he has now been waiting at the train station for over an hour. I try to reason with him, 
agree to meet him there with his belongings since he needs to catch a train. My boyfriend walks with me to the train station, but we arrive only to find it vacant. I live in a small town and the train station is mostly used during rush hours in the morning and evening. It is also located rather bizarrely among normal residences and there are a lot of alleyways leading all over town from there. I get a text message stating that Peter can see us but won't come out of hiding when my boyfriend is there. We leave his stuff on a bench at the train station, calmly replying that I'm not actually interested in meeting with him. When I say calmly, I mean that my reply is calm. I'm shaking and my boyfriend is furious over his child's play. On our way home, I receive another text message. This time, he states that he has a gift for me and it is in my mailbox. This freaks us out even more, mostly because this indicates that he might be waiting at my home. It is entirely possible that he watched us on the train station and then ran all the way to my apartment. However, there is no trace of him and nothing except a bill in my mailbox. By now we figure that he's acting up out of spite and proceeds to ignore the bombardment of text messages, calls, and so forth the following days. After a while, life returns to normal. Then I get another call, this time from my ex's elder brother, who is worried about his sibling. Apparently, he has disappeared, taking one of his brother's gas pistols. I am speechless, but since I haven't seen anything, I shake it off as another childish act. The same day, my boyfriend sees police officers walking around the basement staircase on the exterior of the house that we live in while doing some grocery shopping. He did this every day around 4pm. The next day, we are contacted by my boyfriend's mother. In the newspaper, there is a description of an unnamed young man from the same town as Peter who has been arrested for attempted robbery of the pizza place I lived above. He was armed with a knife, a gas pistol, and a lighter fluid. He stated that he was not attempting a robbery, but was there to visit his ex, presumably me. Contacting the police, I discover that he also had a mask, fake papers, and a wig in a duffel bag, which he had thrown down into the staircase when around 4 p.m. he had jumped a fence and try to enter the pizza place. This means that my boyfriend went out of our front door while my ex was hiding right beside the front door and armed. I have never been that freaked out before. The sad truth is that my ex never got charged with anything because he is a minor as a father with a military background as well as money. I write this now because after three years I thought that this horror story was finally a closed chapter. That was until I received a declaration of love from a fake email account which was signed Peter. I received this just two weeks ago. Edit. Thanks for all the comments, especially the sympathy. To clarify, I never wrote him back and marked the mail as spam. Hopefully, it will be the last time I ever hear from him. The hotel I worked at was small, only 53 rooms in the entire place. It's located next to downtown, in a town in central Minnesota. As a night audit, you worked by yourself with the shift being from 11pm to 7am. You honestly don't get many people checking into the hotel at night, one to three at the most. The first duty as the night audit was to lock the doors so only guests could get in with their keys. There is also a phone on the wall next to the main entrance in case somebody arrives after the doors are locked or somebody orders a pizza, what have you. There is a front door in the lobby, a back door in the lobby as well and even two side doors. Anyway, I proceeded to lock all the doors and head into the back room behind the front desk to do laundry. 
As there is no staff on hand to do laundry, another task for the night audit is to finish any remaining laundry that wasn't finished during the daytime. There is a cordless phone you can bring with you when going into the back or around other parts of the hotel. We had no more scheduled check-ins that night, but there were a couple of rooms available. I heard somebody try and open the front door. They were unsuccessful and left. Moments later, the phone rang, and when I answered, the other person did not talk right away. I walked up to the front desk, and the other person finally started talking. They went on a spiel, saying that they were a former police officer, and something about, forgive me, this part is a bit fuzzy, and I semi-blacked out due to fear. Having court in the morning, and that if they weren't let in, they were going to come in and shoot me, and that they were circling the hotel. Now, there are windows that look out to the front of the hotel, that are visible from the computer that I had walked to during the phone call. I told them I was sorry we didn't have any rooms available, and they hung up before I even finished my sentence. I looked out the window, and there was a person standing across the street, staring back at me with a phone in their hand. At this point, I'm really freaking out, and I go to all the doors to double check that they are still locked. It was a good thing I checked, because one of the side doors had been propped open with a doorstop. Obviously, I shut the door, and then I proceeded to go to a conference room with a sight of where the person was standing. I kept the lights off and peeked through the blinds, but the person was long gone. Needless to say, I was pretty freaked out the rest of the night because there are windows pretty much everywhere in this hotel, so if this person was watching me, they would be able to see me all night if they pleased. So, person who threatened to shoot me while I was at work. Let's not meet. Edit. Thanks to all of you for your concern. I no longer work at that hotel due to complications of working overnights and being a full-time college student as well. I've been reading and listening to a lot of creepy stories lately. I suddenly realized, past a few friends and family, I really haven't told many people this story. So, here it goes. When I was 10 to 12 years old, I can't remember exactly what age, I had a very disturbing encounter with a plain white van. To preface this a little better, I lived on the outskirts of a small town in Texas. Now I live in town. My only friend that lived anywhere near me was a childhood friend who had since moved. However, I had developed a friendship with her aunt, a substitute teacher that worked at my school. It was not uncommon for me to visit her aunt about a mile and a half up a major highway. It's a state highway running north to south with a lot of traffic. I would occasionally on a whim go out and bike. I've always been overweight so exercise was unusual. While biking to her house one day, I noticed a van behind me get on the shoulder with her blinker on behind me as if to turn down her road as it was the only one for a good quarter mile on the right. Knowing that there were a few more houses down the road, I didn't think anything of it. It followed me up to the road as I turned down it, but instead of turning however, it parked perpendicular to the road, as if blocking it. Feeling something was wrong, I hastened to her door, her trailer being the first house and in plain view of the road. Eyeing the van, I ran to her front door and then began knocking. The van sat there unmoving, with tinted windows. I knocked again, constantly looking between the door and the van. A good minute or two had passed, and I had begun knocking very loudly, banging, in desperation. She had to be home. Her car was there, after all. I looked over at the van, and began to see the passenger side door facing me, slowly, begin to open. At that exact moment, my friend's aunt opened the door and asks me what's wrong. Before explaining anything, 
I glanced back at the van. The door that was opening then slammed shut and the van took off. After explaining everything and taking a moment to calm down, she took me and my bike home. I explained the entire thing to my grandmother, who was more than a little worried about the situation. I never saw that exact same van again, and since that day, I still feel very uncomfortable around unmarked white vans, and I'm weary of any car that looks as if it may be tailing me. Anyway, I can never be sure of their intentions, but to this day, I feel like I narrowly avoided being kidnapped that day. TV shows and movies usually depict abductors driving white or black vans. I didn't realize this until I decided to buy a white 1994 Dodge Ram cargo van to haul some of the gear I needed for work. While driving it, I've been pulled over by cops and searched three times for no reason, but that is another story. The point is, some people see vans as suspicious. One day while returning home, a woman pushing a stroller stared at me for a long time while I drove along my home street. We have speed bumps and I had a lot of expensive, delicate gear in the van, so I was driving very slowly. She stared at me, wide-eyed, the entire time. So I smiled at her, like a friendly neighbor does. She was staring so intently that she almost walked the stroller right off the edge of the curb. I thought it was funny and almost forgot about it. A week later, our HOA email thread heats up when a resident sends out a notice that his wife and toddler were being stalked by a man in a white van. Fearing a pitchfork and torch mop mistaking me for the creeper, I replied to all saying I live in the neighborhood and also drive a white van. I even provided my license plate number and home address as well. Big mistake. Jokingly, I added that I also witnessed a suspicious person in the neighborhood, a woman with a stroller who was staring at me so long and hard it made me uncomfortable. I provided the date and time of the incident to see if their alleged stalker was actually me. It was. Dude got triggered. He started sending email after email, CCing everyone on the list, telling me he can read between the lines of what I was saying. His accusations became more and more ludicrous and turned into personal attacks. Several neighbors on the email list replied that he was behaving badly. The emails, however, eventually stopped, but things got even weirder. On several occasions while out walking my dog, a 10-ish year old girl would come out of her house, run over to me, awkwardly chat me up about my dog, and give me strangely intimate details about her life. I wondered why this child was talking to strangers, but I thought maybe she just knew me from the neighborhood, so I politely played along. Then one day, the girl shows up in my house. She said she was angry because her dad wouldn't let her have a dog like mine, so she wanted to visit my dog for a while. I told her that I needed to talk to her parents before I could ever let her visit my house like this. She said okay and left, and I never saw her anymore. I have two daughters, and one of their friends told me the girl who was chatting me up is the daughter of the triggered dude from the HOA email list. He had been sending her out to talk to me and taking pictures. My daughter's friends was friends with this bait girl. The poor girl's dad was making his own daughter uncomfortable, which is why she confined in her friend. The dad was then sending his daughter out to chat with me so he could accuse me of I don't know what. One detail I forgot to mention. I have dash cams in all of my vehicles and... CCTV monitoring my front door. So the initial incident with the wife, as well as the girl coming to my door, were recorded. I emailed the triggered dude and kindly offered him copies of the videos of each incident. 
I also told him I was concerned that his daughter was behaving inappropriately towards strangers. Apparently, this scuttled his plan, as I never heard from him again. TLDR Driver of Scary Van gets stalked by delusional victims, delusional husband, who uses their 10-year-old daughter as bait. Hey, just a quick warning before I start this next story. It does contain some triggering information. It's some information about sexual assault that happened to OP. However, this doesn't mean it's the primary focus of the story, as there is more that comes with it. Do remember that these are horror stories that I'm covering, so there are going to be some things that might be a bit traumatic. Anyway, with that said, if it is something that you're uncomfortable with, then you can use the chapter's feature below to skip to the next story. If not, then here is that story in its entirety. Just a heads up, this is a long story, and it involves some violence as well. I apologize if I'm posting this in the wrong spot, but it has elements of stalking, and I was terrified by this person for quite some time. So, this happened about 10 years ago, when I was in college. I was a sophomore, about 19 to 20 years old, and I'm female. I was horribly naive. The college I went to was a religious school. This is partly the reason this problem continued on as long as it did, and had several rules that students had to follow. The rules important to the story include no drinking on campus. You could only visit the opposite sex in the room during visitation hours, and during visitation, the door had to be left open. I was a not unattractive girl, and I happened to draw the attention of a guy who shared the same major as I did. This means we had a bunch of classes together. He introduced himself to me as Andy, and we began talking. He was very tall, about six foot four, and quite heavy. At one point, he weighed about 300 pounds. He expressed romantic interest in me, but I wasn't attracted to him and told him this whenever he brought it up. He would immediately backtrack and say how happy he was being my friend, and he didn't mind that I didn't care about him romantically. I did get along very well with him though, and we hung out, just the two of us, pretty frequently. The other people in our classes began to expect to see us together, and we became fast friends. Andy had a girlfriend, when we met, who attended another school. He broke up with her during the summer break between freshman and sophomore year. But unbeknownst to me, the reason for the breakup was that he wanted to start pursuing me more actively. When I came back from summer break, something had changed, and he became more forward towards me, often making comments about how pretty I was and that I should be with him. I began to become uncomfortable with the attention, and so I told him many times. I unfortunately didn't want to lose him as a friend, since he was the only one of my few friends I hung out with. A lot of those friends I met through him, so if I cut him off, I would have close to no one to talk to. Andy would often swing wildly from charming and sweet to insulting and manipulative. He would offer to take me to places and help me with things, then would say that I owed him something in return for those things. He would say we were so close and... We should date since we were already practically together all the time. Alcohol made it worse. I tried to avoid drinking with him, but it did happen occasionally, either off campus or sneakily while in his dorm room. He sometimes used my past relationships to manipulate me into feeling guilty. As a religious person, I had committed a cardinal sin by sleeping with two guys I had previously dated before meeting Andy. He brought this up a lot, implying that I was damaged goods because of this. He had at one point told me, I'm the best man that you could possibly get because of your past. Eventually, I caved in and told him I'd date him just to see if there was any feelings there whatsoever. This, of course, made him ecstatic, but it also made him extremely overprotective of me 
and jealous of any attention I received from anyone of the opposite sex. He would constantly call and text me constantly, and if I didn't pick up the first time, he would call until I did. He constantly questioned where I was going to be and would follow me there if possible. I worked for the college as a short order cook at their late night grill and Andy would wait for me to get off of work almost every single night. He would sit at one of the tables for hours just waiting for me to finish my shift. It began to creep me out but I chalked it up to him being an overprotective boyfriend. We did eventually have sex but I was still not physically attracted to Andy and I was essentially waiting for him to finish every time we did the deed. He made me feel like it was a necessary part of our relationship and that because I slept with my exes, I also needed to sleep with him. Despite this, I did genuinely enjoy his company and our conversations when he wasn't being so possessive. We tried being in a relationship for two months until Christmas break rolled around. When I went home, I had a chance to clear my head and speak to my family about the situation. My mom especially seemed uncomfortable with how frequently Andy contacted me, and it got way worse while we were apart. He got a hold of my family members' Facebook pages, as well as phone numbers, and he would call or message them whenever I didn't immediately answer his calls or text messages. It got to the point where he was calling me upwards of 10 times a day, and I had hundreds of text messages from him. This was a time where you had to pay for a certain number of text messages per month, and no matter how many times I told him he was using up my text messages, he would still message me. I honestly couldn't afford this relationship anymore. After thinking long and hard about it, I called him up. I told him how I felt that I thought this relationship wasn't working. I said the cliché phrase, I still want to be friends, and I genuinely meant it. Andy, however, flipped out. He began calling and messaging me even more frequently than before, at all hours of the day and night, swinging wildly from, You broke my heart, please come back to me, to, How dare you, you stupid bitch, I deserve way better than you, and back again. I had no clue what to do. I dreaded returning to school. When the day finally came and I went back to campus, Andy sought me out. He would freak out on me for no reason, curse at me, and call me names, then apologize profusely. His attitudes would change frequently, sometimes the next day. Sometimes even the next hour, he still waited for me outside of work. He still followed me back to my dorm. He still walked with our group of friends too and from class. When they were around, he would pretend to want to be friends, then wait until we were walking alone and start in on me. He would push me or step on the back of my heels while I was walking and mock me. Then when I complained, he would say he was just joking. I didn't realize it at the time, but he was showing all these warning signs and I was too stupid and naive to pick up on them. I did tell him I thought we needed to spend some time apart, and that worked, at least for a short while. Andy eventually seemed to even out, and a few weeks later invited me to his dorm room to play video games with him as a peace offering. When I arrived, he snuck me in the back way so he didn't have to leave the door open. He offered me a drink. This made me nervous, but I was an underage college student, so far be it for me to turn down an alcoholic beverage. Everything seemed to be going alright. We were getting along and joking around as well, so I got more comfortable. I had another drink, and very quickly after this, I started to feel excitingly tired and had trouble standing. I don't know if he was topping off my drink when I wasn't looking, or if God forbid, he put something in my drink, but there was no way I was leaving that room that night. Andy became very accommodating and arranged for me to crash on his couch. I agreed, but I could tell that something wasn't right. 
So I told them in a drowsy voice, while slurring my words, that under no uncertain terms was he to try anything sexual that night. He laughed it off, but agreed, and the last thing I remember is curling up on the couch and falling asleep. I don't need to tell you what happened that night while I was passed out. The next morning, when I found out, I was horrified. I yelled at Andy who laughed it off as something funny that I brought on myself by drinking. And then I left. I went to my dorm room across campus, crawled into bed, and cried. I skipped classes that day and stayed in my room the whole time. I ended up calling out of work. I didn't want to do anything or see anyone. I didn't tell anyone what happened then, and I honestly didn't know that what happened was considered sexual assault until months later. At some point during the afternoon, Andy tried to sneak into my room. I freaked out, yelling at him to get the hell out. He apologized and told me he just wanted to drop off some things and didn't think I'd be here. He had a hot water bottle and flowers. How sweet. Not. He kind of threw them in the room and then shut the door as I yelled at him to leave me alone. A couple of months went by and he still followed me sometimes, but I told him to back off. He still messaged me, but I mostly ignored him the whole time. He followed me off a of campus on multiple occasions and I also learned they had been following me around for quite some time. I began to develop anxiety about seeing him everywhere and went to the campus doctor. I explained a part of the story to him and he gave me some Xyanax and antidepressants to help me with my paranoia. I tried my best to function, but my grades suffered and so did my friendships. By this point, I had maybe three friends left who didn't think I was this horrible person that led Andy on, then dumped him and broke his heart. The icing on the cake for me, I know, I know, it should have been being assaulted, was when Andy crashed my birthday party. Apparently he had asked one of my friends if he could help plan it, but she didn't know that we weren't speaking so she agreed. He showed up to the park where it was being held, drank all the alcohol, then began telling my few friends how much of a bitch I was. He called me a whore. He told them I let him on and broke his heart, and the entire evening was ruined. Unfortunately, he was too drunk to drive himself home, so I was nominated to bring him back by driving his car. I mentioned I didn't want to do this by myself, so a friend offered a ride with me to help carry him into his dorm room. But immediately after that, she booked it. She left me alone with him in his dorm room, even though I told her I was extremely uncomfortable being alone with him. She knew some of what happened, but I think she figured I was being dramatic or even exaggerating. Immediately after she left, all of a sudden, he wasn't that drunk anymore. He immediately turned hostile and threatening. He told me that if I didn't stay with him, he was going to hurt himself, and then he pulled out a pair of scissors. He held the blade of the scissors to his wrist, and I took a step back. I was at a loss of what to do in this situation, so I simply stated that he shouldn't hurt himself, but I really wanted to leave. I backed up and slowly went to the door, but he jumped up, dropped the scissors, thank God, and grabbed my wrist. He yanked me back from the doorway and twisted my arm behind my back until I cried out. He then threw me against the wall face first, slammed the door shut, and locked it. Then he picked me up. I'm fairly tall, but remember, he's close to six foot four and big, and tossed me on his bed. I was terrified, but I told him if he didn't let me go, I was going to scream. He covered my mouth with his hand and told me if I screamed, I would get in trouble for violating visitation. Something I had already gotten in trouble for once before, and there was a risk of being expelled if I got caught again. He said he was going to let me up if I promised to stay in the room with him. I tried to portray that I was calm and relaxed, but inside, 
I was scared for my life. I agreed to stay with him, and he let me up off the bed. I sat up, and with all the strength I could muster, I smiled. I said I would be okay hanging out with him, but I really had to use the bathroom. He agreed, but told me not to take too long. He said he'd be waiting outside the door. The dorm bathroom was actually a shared bathroom between two dorm rooms. In Andy's room, there was a door to the right that led to the bathroom. Then if he walked through the bathroom, there was another door on the opposite side that led to another dorm room. Both bathroom doors could be locked from the outside to prevent someone from one dorm using the bathroom to access the other dorm room. I went into the bathroom and closed Andy's door, then prayed the guys who lived in the next dorm room were trusting enough to leave the bathroom door unlocked. I walked to the other side and tried the doorknob. As a miracle, it turned and I opened the door into the room of two very surprised guys. I apologized and mumbled, I just needed to get out of there before turning to leave. They both stared at me as I ran out of their front door. I left that residence hall and ran all the way across campus to my dorm. All of a sudden, I heard footsteps behind me and heard someone shouting my name. My heart sank. It was Andy. I panicked, but the hall that housed my dorm room was directly ahead of me. I picked up the pace and Andy followed suit. He was gaining on me and it had been ages since I ran. I'm the perfect example of the saying, if I'm running, you better run too, because something is chasing me. I could see the entrance to my dorm. I had my key out and grabbed the door handle of the first set of doors. There were two sets of doors that led into my residence hall. The first one was always unlocked, but the second set you needed a key for. When I got inside the first set of doors, Andy caught up to me and grabbed me by the arm. He tried to use his weight advantage to pull me back away from the second set of doors and out of the entrance. I fought with everything I had, yelling at him to let me go the whole time. I saw through the dorm window that there were people inside the foyer and if I could just get their attention, I could get one of them to open the door. I finally managed to get close enough to the second set of doors to knock. The instant I knocked on that door, Andy let me go. He walked away quickly, letting a few choice curse words fly in my direction, before then jogging back in the direction he had come from. When a guy from inside the foyer opened the door, he saw a girl who was out of breath and on the verge of tears. He asked me if I was okay, and I said, I think so, then waved him away. I ran up to my dorm room and locked the door immediately. The very next day, I contacted my RA about the situation. I showed her some of the messages Andy sent me and explained that he had broken visitation by coming into my dorm to drop off stuff for me and that he had just chased me across campus. She was immediately concerned and so contacted the Dean of Discipline. They instituted a ban on Andy being allowed to enter my dorm and told him to stay away from me and not to contact me anymore. It took him a long time to even begin to comply. I should have gone to the police, obviously, but when I met with the Dean of Discipline, he strongly encouraged me to keep everything in house. He said, we are family and we will deal with this internally like a family should. I didn't learn this until years later, but this is the attitude of many colleges when dealing with victims of stalking and assault who attend their schools. Eventually, over the next summer, I told my mother most of the details about what happened and she cried with me. She was extremely supportive and she drove me five hours to the police department in the town where my college was located so I could file a report. They basically said, since it had been too long since the assault, there wasn't much they could do, but I could try to get a restraining order instead. I followed the directions and was able to get a restraining order against Andy. He violated the order several times, 
and it ended up going back to court. The court put so many restrictions on him that he ended up having to transfer to another college while I finished my degree. When I graduated, I got out of there and never looked back. I returned to my hometown where I moved back with my family and I got a decent job. I've dealt with anxiety, depression, and extreme paranoia since then, and for a while, I was terrified he would find me again and finish what he started. I got a firearm card and bought a handgun that I kept under my nightstand for protection. No small feat in my state, which has decent gun control. I've never had to use it outside of practicing at a range, fortunately. I eventually found a fantastic guy who is amazing, sweet, kind, and very understanding of my past. He is also super handsome, if I might add. We are now married, and I have never been happier. I am so glad I got out of that situation. Many women aren't as lucky. Andy, let's never meet again, because if you try to hurt me, I'll most likely be armed. This has been going on for a while, and I'm not going to name the conventions. The truth is convention security can only do so much to protect patrons. 2007 to 2008, my encounter with a creeper actually was pretty weird. I was staying with a group of six friends. We had two rooms, side to side, with a door in between that opened up. We opened up the room so we could go between for food or drinks. I was doing DDR and a few panels when I noticed I was being watched. I blew it off as myself and two friends walking to a Wendy's for lunch, but somehow I still felt like I was being watched. On the way back, I caught sight of this guy with stringy hair and dressed like L from Death Note. I was at first like impressed, but hell, he looked so out of place. I got into my cosplay from Tenchi Muyo. I was Tenchi and was walking to a photo shoot. Again, that creepy, I am being watched feeling kind of wandered over me. My friend who is dressed as Miss Soshi runs up and says this guy has been tailing me. She and my friend who was dressed as Washu were watching him. I was kind of spooked and after the shoot, I went back to the room to change, but I made sure to call one of the males I was rooming with. Thank goodness, I will call him Koji because that was his RPG character name. Koji is tall and he and his boyfriend were standing guard by the room doors. I was in the bathroom. Koji knocked and I came out in a t-shirt and slacks. He said this guy was outside our door and he was just standing there and staring. Koji's boyfriend, Chris, not his real name, told the guy to get lost and to leave his sister alone. I didn't see the guy until the next convention, six months down the line. This other con, I was doing something from Higurashi and I walked with a few other cosplayers. We were in the same hotel, but different con. So yeah, weird, I know. I saw the same guy dressed as L doing a death note shoot. I was like, okay, as long as he doesn't follow me that's great. But oh no, he followed me again right to my hotel room, where this time my friends were waiting for him. The weird thing is the L stopped me right before my room, so he could ask if I knew him, and I said no. Apparently he had been to a party I threw about a year ago. I was kind of weirded out because I remembered who I invited to that party and he was not one I remembered. Now I am not a pretty thin girl, I am kind of plus sized, so I am at the time about 27 years old and single. He started to ask me out with this enthusiasm of some kid, turns out he was 17. I had my rules and though I looked 18 or something, I told this guy no. The whole con, he continued to tell my friends and I, he tried to even join my group for our Sunday dinner. I was like, hell no. My friend said he was harmless, but my gut said something else entirely. Later, 
Elle found me on MySpace, then Facebook, but I made sure nothing came of his pursuit. He basically continued his attempts, and this was when it became outright creepy. 2018 to now. So yeah, to present day. I started doing a meet with fans of a show from the 1990s called Forever Night. I got a message from a friend I will call Mickey, who asked what I was doing. I told him I was watching Forever Night. He then decided to check it out, but I had no idea it was friends with L. The next few days, I was working and was on my Facebook, and I saw a message from L. Well, okay. After I turned him down back in 2007, I thought he moved on. Well, he was talking about how cool Forever Night was, and I was awesome. I was kind of like, okay, must be new to the fandom, and how does he know I am an admin? Basically, I was like, okay, you're a fan, just don't message me. So that was when he started to use my real name, because as an admin of my page, I use Forever Night as the title. I was like, whoa, how'd he know that? So I asked and he told me Mickey was his roommate. I messaged Mickey and asked what the hell. He said he didn't know anything about Elle's history. So I was hoping to ask Mickey if Elle knew where I lived. Well, you host viewings, but those are on Meetup. He realized that Elle had an account there too and joined my group. Needless to say, I was freaking out and my fiancé was at work. I was so freaked out I cancelled the meetup until next month. Al was banned from the group, and he messaged asking why he was banned. He also said he would make me understand we were soulmates. Now, I ran into him at a convention in September, and he asked me again why he was blocked and banned. I told him I never wanted to see him again, or request anything from my fan group, because he just liked my stuff because I liked it. Apparently, I was contacted by girls he dated and stalked for a while. Elle had issues and still had this unhealthy obsession with these girls to the point that they dropped out of anime fandoms or just outright wanted to file restraining orders. But because Elle is not in a stable home, we can't get anything to stick. Anyway, follow your gut. It's been about a month, and no contact. So, L, I hope we never meet again.